Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. I'm excited to be attending and recording shows at Rainmaker 2016. You can join keynote speaker Gary Vanderchuk along with modern revenue leaders at the only conference dedicated to the sales development industry, March 7th and 9th in Atlanta. Get tickets now to receive cutting-edge sales content from thought leaders, learn best practices during breakout sessions, and come network with the world's top sales influencers. If you use the promo code BTFS and the number 30, you'll get 30% off. More information is on the show website at buildingthefutureshow.com. I'm also going to be at the Business Rocks Tech, Music, and Investment Summit recording shows live in Manchester, England, April 21st and 22nd, where Steve Wozniak is headlining. More information about the summit is on the show website at buildingthefutureshow.com. Sabo, welcome back to the show. It's been awesome. I'm glad um, you're, you're, I guess, agreed to do this again, because the first (laughs) time we chatted, it was awesome. Um, You kind of got me really thinking about other mediums. Um, So, you know, I thought, why not do my first blab with you, because you were the reason basically I got thinking about doing this. So thanks for doing this again. It's awesome. Yeah, of course. It's great to be back on the show. We had a lot of fun talking about sort of the basics of live stream and the first section that we sort of recorded. And so I'm excited to kind of come back, talk about Periscope and Blab. Sure. So maybe do you want to kind of give a little bit of a quick intro about yourself and, you know, and if people want, they can go to um, buildingthefutureshow.com and listen to your previous episode, but maybe just give the listener a little bit of a background. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Saba and I am a marketing strategist and content strategist. Um, I help small businesses with their marketing strategies, specifically in social media. So I focus a lot on the newer mediums that are currently being utilized, such as live streaming, uh, things like Snapchat. I mean, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, all those things I'm very well versed in and I've you know learned them throughout the years, but my focus is more the emerging social media space and live streaming specifically. Okay. Awesome. No, that's, that's cool because I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really like I work in tech, but I'm not, I don't really think of myself that great at social media, believe it or not. Like it's just, <laughs> I don't know. It's been kind of a interesting journey for me. Um, but uh, I do enjoy it and I'm kind of getting into this space. So maybe let's, let's talk about kind of, what is Blab? And I know we're on it and a lot of the people that are probably listening right now understand that, but when this does air on FM radio, they might not know what it is. Right. So Blab is a platform where you can basically create a live video show or have a live video conversation with a maximum of four people and a minimum of one. So you could be the only one on the screen. And some of the advantages of doing this is that there's no borders. So anyone from the globe that has internet connection can basically call in or participate through the chat on their mobile device or on their desktop. And you can record the show and you'll be able to grab the audio as well as the video. And so it's a very low barrier way to create really great content with, um, in collaboration with others. Sure. And well, realistically, most people nowadays have a computer with a built-in camera or whatnot and mic, and even the mics on most computers nowadays aren't that bad. So I think we're kind of at the very beginning of this whole space. Yeah, it's definitely pretty new. I mean, uh, live streaming is not a new technology, but in terms of accessibility and data plans and other sort of more structural things that allow us to actually stream and reach the masses, it's definitely at a point where it's more feasible now than it was when the live streaming technology came out back in 2010 and 2011. Sure. Okay. So maybe before we kind of get into Periscope, maybe let's talk about like how you'd use Blab for your business. Yeah, so um, there's so many different ways to use Blab for your business. I mean, it just depends on what industry you're in, what space you're in, what uh, your focus is. So a few examples is one, you could just have like Product Hunt has um, basically like a live podcast that you do. You bring on different people that are relevant to your business or the the services or the products that you provide and you interview them. And you just basically create content um, that you feel like your audience and your community is going to find value in. Another way that you could use live video um, on Blab is 
you can actually do some crowdsourcing, whether it's, you know, what type of products are you guys liking? What type of campaigns are you liking? I know Experion does uh, their credit score chat, not only on Twitter, but they also do it on Blab. And so it's a way for them to kind of humanize their brand. A large corporation like that usually um, kind of gets lost in the mix and they don't really people don't know if they can trust them on social because they don't know who's running the medium. And oh, once you put yeah. someone on a screen, uh, you actually become more invested in that company because you know who's running it, right? And although a business has a lot of different components, I mean, at the end of the day, you do business and you work with businesses where you like the people and what they stand for. And so it's really about getting on screen and talking to people and really building that connection. No, that makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting. I, I never really thought of it, I guess, because most people nowadays know that people that run their Twitter and social media and Facebook and whatnot are probably just like a PR firm or a marketing agency or, or but if you put the CEO or, you know, somebody, you know, on screen or on camera, well, obviously it's that person. So that's, yeah, that's actually really interesting. Do you find though, with these kind of big corporations that it's, it can be tricky to get them, you know, doing this kind of cutting edge things yeah i mean there's obviously a lot of red tape um and there's a lot of things that they have to worry about on the legal side because you know not only is it you know live video but it's also you're bringing in people from the audience you don't know what they're going to say what they're going to do um but it's all about sort of making sure that you build a really strong community around your brand and a lot of time the a lot of times these rooms are very self-policing i don't know if we talked about this um, in the previous podcast where we just talked about live streaming in general, but most of the communities don't have as many trolls as someone may think. And I think that's one of the biggest fears for larger corporations is their PR. But a lot okay. of times, um, if they just come and they be really honest, or I mean, we're assuming that they have something to defend, right? But if, right. for example, I'm just thinking of an example right now, like let's say Chipotle decided to put their communications team or their management team on Blab, right? If they're open and honest and they really want to provide value and answer questions, no one's going to be um, trolling or ruining the conversation. And I think that's right. where the fine line is that larger organizations are just so scared of what the population is going to say but the reality is is they're already saying these things on social right you can't censor sure. them on facebook you can't censor them on twitter and i think coming on live video it just provides them an opportunity to really answer those questions and probably just create a more level playing field no that makes a lot of sense and i, I think that's that's actually really quite interesting so I, i'm kind of curious um, how you kind of go about getting these kind of clients to actually go on and do this stuff? Like, do you have any tips for people out there if they're looking to kind of get their clients into doing streaming? Do you mean like an agency getting their clients to do streaming? What do you mean by that question? Exactly? Well, I guess, yeah. Would it be like an agency? Like, I guess, yeah, an agency or kind of even the Experian guys. Like, how did you get them to do this kind of thing? Okay, well, Experian, I didn't get them to do it. Actually, uh, what happened was, is they were doing a Twitter chat, they were doing periscopes, they were dabbling on Blab. Um, and I just really had a conversation with their head of social sort of about the different ways that he can optimize the use of these platforms. Because there's one thing to just get on the platform and begin utilizing right and then the next step okay. is really making sure that you're using it optimally and you're getting the best results and you're really squeezing the juice out of the results that you can get and a lot of the right. things that um prevent a lot of larger companies or even you know mid-sized companies onto coming to these platforms is you know they say you know i don't have enough analytics there's not enough data mm -hmm. behind this right they just okay. always want that proof and one of the things that i always tell them is that by the time there's all of those things built in you've already missed the opportunity to really get a big share of the market right and we're t i mean we're not going to talk about snapchat right now but th that's the same situation with snapchat right now a lot of marketers are saying well there's no data there's no analytics that i can pull off a desktop but if you look at the numbers just sheer numbers of 7 billion video views daily versus Facebook sure. has 8 billion. I mean, how is how are they not competitive in the marketplace? But they still don't want to admit it because people don't like change. People don't like being out of their comfort zone. And so naturally, they're just going to steer away, especially a new um, emerging channel such as live stream, which a lot of people are very intimidated by. Yeah, no, that's fair. And I, I would, I, in some ways, I would almost include myself in that, right? Like, it's... Like I said earlier, this is my the first time I've done this. You know, I've been 
doing a podcast for a while. And when we first, you and I first recorded, it was basically just through Skype, right? And I think it's kind of interesting that even people in the space are kind of a little weary of some of the newer stuff. And I, I know you and I are going to, in a couple of days on Tuesday, we're going to do a show on Snapchat. That's another thing to me that kind of is a little bit foreign and other than sending certain types of images, I, I've not really known it to be anything other than that. And when you and I talked before that, you know, you're going to convince me why Snapchat's good for kind of other things. Right. And I'm, I'm excited to know about that, but yeah, like I think, I think it's great. And I, I think just talking about kind of this whole space with people and, and, you know, if people have questions, we're, we're happy to kind of, um, I guess, answer those. I, I know somebody already asked about, um, can you kick someone out who's being disruptive and others in the chat are being saying, yeah, I'm assuming, do you want to maybe elaborate on how you can kind of handle people that are being disruptive or kind of trolling you in on these things? Yeah, sure. So to answer Dave's question, uh, can someone, can you kick someone out who is being disruptive? You can. So if they're being disruptive in the chat, actually Blab has built in a feature where you can and actually delete their comments um, and you can actually block them right from the chat area and then it actually sends out kind of a notification to the blab team and they kind of do a further investigation around what happened the other way that you can actually uh kick them out uh quote unquote is if they do call in and um you know they're in a setting that you're not okay with there's too much background noise or they're saying something that you don't want them uh, to be saying on your show then you can actually just exit them out and kick them out and so it's very instant. The okay. hosts of the show have complete control of the room. And so um, some of the tips that I would tell people is, um, is to make sure that when you do see someone calling in to just click on their profile, see if they have, you know, a minimum of at least 20, 25 followers, maybe click on their Twitter, see if it seems like it's someone that's verified or if it's just kind of a, a random account, an egg account. Um, I'm pretty strict with the people that I let into my room in terms of um, it's not that I screen them fully, but if, you know, you have five or six followers and you don't have a clear profile picture, I most likely won't let you in. Okay. No, that makes sense. I, I guess it's kind of no different than if you like just looking at somebody's profile picture for other kind of social media stuff. And sometimes like if you don't have a photo and you're trying to be friends with me on Facebook, I'm probably not going to add you like stuff like that. Right. I think in, in a lot of cases, that's pretty clear. Um, one of the questions that I think is kind of interesting that kind of came through is, uh, have you ever looked into streaming a green screen background to make it more professional? <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, no, that's that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I I think that when you kind of have a natural setting, it's a little bit more easing to the eye. Um, I've seen people come on the show that have had the green screens. And for me, it's a little bit unsettling. I don't like it. I'd rather see like that board behind you with writing. Um, I have a painting sure. behind me. Um, you know, that's just my preference. I think it just adds to the setting. I mean, it's, I think it's just unnatural, right? You want to make live streaming and the way that you talk and the way that you create this content to be really free flowing and just almost like pre outlined and not too uh, produced. And so when you kind of do all those extra things for the production, I think it takes away from the content. Yeah, agreed. I agreed. No, I, I think it's interesting. And I actually kind of like that you have a photo in the background. I was like, oh, yeah, I just have like writing on a whiteboard <laughs> wall thing. But that's cool. Whatever. Yeah. Um, OK. And I guess another question that came through that um, do you have any best practices um, for agencies that have clients uh, that work for the SMB startup nonprofit sector? Um, are they talking about best practices for conducting a blab or starting a blab? So I'm just going to, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, um, what you want to do is first you want to strategize and plan. Yes. It's live stream. Yes. You don't want it to be too produced, but you still have to do a lot of the back end work. So I host sure. three, uh, podcasts weekly on blab. And one of the things that I do with my co-hosts is that I'm, oh, that's actually one thing. Make sure you have a co-host and there's two people that are hosting it because it uh, creates for better dialogue and more engaged viewership. But I would first sit down okay. and talk about your strategy, right? Like any other social media platform that you're going to get on, you want to make sure there's an objective and there's a plan and you know kind of the direction that you want to go in and what type of content you're going to be feeding your audience in order to make sure that you hit the goals that you have set for yourself. And so, um, I mean, SMB startups, nonprofit, those are three very different, uh, categories. So, sure. um, okay, let's, <laughs> let's start with the, let's start with the startup. Um, and then I'll go through the other two. Um, sure. 
for a startup, the big, biggest issue that they usually have is um, user, they need user acquisition, right? So they're trying to get their name out there. They're trying to build brand equity and they're really trying to create sort of momentum around their brand because they have just launched. And a lot of times um, an example I'll give is if you're, for example, a new type of dating app. One thing that you can do is you okay. can start conducting interviews around people that have expertise tangent to dating. For example, uh, you know, how you should conduct yourself on a date, you know, how to find the best restaurants, maybe find someone from Yelp um, that you can interview. And so basically find people that are experts around the space that you um, are interested in and interview them and provide your community with value. You basically become a media channel, right? So instead of them going on to Elite Daily or going on to Mashable or any other website like Thrillist, to find out what they should do around going on dates, you provide that information for them. Um, in terms of nonprofit sector, there's been some uh, nonprofit founders that have uh, gotten interviewed, and you can interview different types of people who maybe work for your organization or have or who have different experiences to kind of talk about sort of um, you know how it's impacted their lives or how participating has impacted their lives. Um, in the SMB sector, I mean, that could be any industry, but really you, you can do anything from a Q&A to crowdsourcing to just having a conversation and allowing the audience or your community to meet the people that work there. I mean, there are so many different ways to strategize um, how to basically utilize these live streaming platforms. And specifically, my answer was catered towards Blab um, because the other live streaming platforms are a little bit different. Sure. So just kind of maybe as a follow-up kind of question at that, um, Barb's asking, how do you prepare scheduled guests before you bring them on screen? Okay, great question. Um, so the thing that I do is I try to make it as easy as possible for the guest. Uh, you want to respect their time. You want to make sure that they know that, you know, things are going to go smoothly. So for me, what I do is I actually schedule a 15 minute call and I make it very clear to them that it's going to be 15 minutes. And I say, we're going to okay. talk about the, uh, the different topics that we are going to bring on during the show. And so during the phone call, I just ask them to basically explain what topics they think are best for us to discuss based on their expertise. And I make notes okay. throughout the show. And then what I do is based on everything that they talked about, I create questions that prompt the dialogue to lead there. And then what I do is I send them okay. those five questions and I say, you know, these are going to be the five questions that are basically going to lead us into certain types of dialogue. And I say, you know, if you have any amendments or if you have any changes, let me know. And then uh, if they say yes, then they make the amendments and no, we just move on and we all know what the discussion is going to be like. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I guess that's kind of like similar to what I do is I usually send kind of a rough show outline to people just so they have an idea of kind of what questions I'm roughly going to ask. And then, you know, if we stray from that, that's fine. But it's nice to kind of have a little bit of a guideline and, and kind of know. Um, Emirates Live is asking, um, what is the best use of Snapchat for brands? And what's the best of Periscope for brands? So maybe before we kind of answer that, do you want to maybe kind of cover what Periscope is used for compared to Blab? I know we kind of covered a little bit about Blab, but maybe you want to go to Periscope and then kind of answer that question. Yeah, that's a great idea. So uh, Periscope, for those of you who are not fam familiar, is a live streaming mobile application that allows you to broadcast to anyone in the world who has uh, the application. And so really the way that it's different from Blab is that you don't, um, you don't have multiple people on the screen. And so basically think of it like, video chatting, but the other person has no video. And it's basically a one-way direct channel where you communicate with people. So this is a really great okay. medium if you want to broadcast a news segment or you just want to talk about something. So it's very similar to basically if you were going to create a YouTube video for your, uh, for your channel and then you live streaming basically that content where you're not having dialogue with multiple people. And a lot of times people try to have two people on the screen. I know um, Tarte and Sephora, some of the uh, makeup brands that I follow, uh, they have two people sort of that they bring onto the screen, but it's a more of a one-way broadcasting channel. And so that's how you utilize that one. And it's mobile only, and you won't be able to stream uh, through your desktop, but you are able to consume uh, from your browser. Okay. And I, I, at least for me, I know like Mark Cuban always kind of um, periscopes around and in between like the Shark Tank segments. Right. And that to me, like I like that show. I watch it pretty much weekly. So it's kind of fascinating that 
you know, somebody like him that has a huge user base and following, and I'm not saying it's just credited to him because there's other people doing something similar, but he seems to be one of those people that have almost made this space mainstream, I guess, for lack of a better term, or, or starting to become more mainstream. Would you agree? I do. I do agree to a point. I think that Mark Cuban okay. actually has a lot of interesting thoughts. If you listen to some of his interviews about live stream, he's not fully in, sure. uh, but he okay. does utilize, he does utilize the platform correctly. Right. So he's basically broadcasting an experience that he is having that he wants his audience to also experience. And the experience sure. in a lot of times, like you said, um, are, you know, when he's in the tank, when they're doing recordings, uh, when he's maybe at an interesting place, when he's at a basketball show. So there's different ways to utilize it. Um, I think we've talked about this before. Uh, Marcus Limonis also uses it sometimes when he is uh, recording The Prophet. And so a lot of these right. bigger name people who are not live streaming through their own personal apps, like for example, the Kardashians are, uh, where they've created right. sort of more of a barrier and a wall in order to uh, get that content, they are just using Periscope as that broadcast channel to immediately show content. And then it's up for 24 hours um, for anyone who missed it, they can watch on the replay. I got you. Okay. So maybe do you want to kind of go back to the question about like, what's the best use for Snapchat compared to kind of Periscope and maybe even Blab? Like, is there kind of different things that you should do on each one of those mediums? Yeah. So uh, let's start with the um, the best way to utilize Periscope for brands. Uh, okay, sure. The best way to do that is to provide very similar content to what you're doing on your YouTube channel. And if you say, okay, I'm not using doing anything on my YouTube channel, then you have to figure out a content strategy, right? Which goes back to the previous question about what type of blab should I do? You need to, you need to right. get to the drawing board. And that's really where I come in, in terms of a content strategist, um, okay. where I help them understand where are the uh, places of opportunity for them to really capitalize on. So we talk about sort of, you know, what is your current marketing strategy? What are the campaigns you are running right now? And how can live streaming complement those? Because a lot of times they already have um, existing infrastructure, infrastructure that they have created on the marketing end. And it's just a way to basically optimize and grow that viewership. And so for Emirates, which I believe is a airline company, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for them, it would be a lot about, you know, I would do takeovers with influencers. I would make sure to really show the experience with Emirates. Um, I don't know if they were working with um, Anika uh, Moraji is a good friend of mine who lives in Dubai. She actually took Emirates coming to uh, the Periscope Summit in San Francisco that's going on. And um, she did a lot of great uh she did a lot of great Snapchats. And so she is a really great person to utilize. And then they can also create content on their own handles, right? So they want to have an Emirates right. Live um, channel and then just, you know, interview maybe some of their travelers about, you know, what experiences they have, why they use their airline and really make not only their brand elevate, but make their travelers and their customers feel like they are very, very valued. No, that makes a lot of sense. And then any thoughts on kind of the Snapchat angle? Yeah, I have so much to say about Snapchat. That is currently, um, you know, I love live streaming and all of social media, but Snapchat sure. is probably my absolute favorite because I'm able to utilize it throughout my whole day. I've actually dropped in my Snapchat name um, in the chat, which is just my full name, Saba, and then S-E-D-I-G-H-I. -I. And there are just so many ways to utilize Snapchat because of the tools that it, it is provided for you. And you just have to create a story. You have to tell a story. We always talk about social media you know, how are you storytelling? And really, this is just another medium of storytelling. But you have so many creative tools at your disposal that make it so easy. Um, I've actually tweeted out on my Twitter different ways that you can create graphics. You can create shout outs. You can do announcements. You can do flash sales. Um, you can give out exclusive content. You can do product launches. You can show different videos. You can do takeovers. I mean, the amount of options on Snapchat is um, never ending, especially for consumer facing brands uh, such as Emirates or, you know, Sephora's and Under Armour and Nike's of the world, or even small companies. I name some of the bigger ones because I follow them, but. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, just kind of another question here that's coming through. Um, when you notice your audience um, or how do you notify, I guess, your audience and, and um, where does the notifi notification show up? Okay, so I'm assuming he's asking about uh, 
Periscope, Snapchat, I mean, all these platforms. So um, on Periscope sure. specifically, we'll start with that one. If you follow someone, you automatically opt in to receive their uh, push notifications. Um, okay. If you decide that you want to mute that person but still follow them, uh, if you go into your app, you'll see when they're live, but you won't get a push notification. Uh, he says that he's specifically asking about Blab. So you can turn right. on your desktop notifications. And so right now, for example, I just saw that eLive followed me. Um, so I have my notifications for my Chrome browser on. And so I get notified when someone that I follow schedules a Blab or goes live on Blab. And so these are all just notifications that you can play with. And the people that follow you, they have their own settings as well. And the same thing for your push notifications on your mobile device. You're able to uh, turn them on and off depending on you know, what your preference is. No, that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm, another question coming in here. Um, how would Snapchat be useful to a local nonprofit like American Cancer Society? Yeah, great question. I mean, it could definitely be useful, right? The American Cancer Society... Um, they, I'm sure, put on a lot of different events. They have a lot of education that they're providing to the community. I actually studied uh, health policy in college. And so I'm really familiar with the nonprofit sector and the healthcare sector. And so um, they could do a lot of interesting content around, you know, why you shouldn't smoke, you know, what are preventative ways to um, avoid getting cancer. I mean, there's so many educational ways to also use these platforms. And so it's just a matter of figuring out what content you really want to put out there. And then the next step is, you know, how do you creatively execute on that content? And these are just all things. I mean, all these examples are just content strategy things that um, either I can help with or someone internally that you've hired can uh, put together for you. Sure. And I think a lot of this stuff has to be a little bit of trial and error per network, right? Decide what social media networks you want to go for first. And then over time, you know, like try some some things on Facebook, try some stuff on Twitter, try some stuff on Blab, try some like, you know, and, and obviously maybe post different things at different times to the different networks and see what people like on those networks. At least when I'm promoting the radio show, I find like in different content for sure works on different mediums. Right. And for, for example, I haven't cracked YouTube yet. Can't figure it out. Haven't spent a ton of time doing it, but it's one of those networks that no matter kind of what I post there, content doesn't really seem to do well. But on other mediums, it does extremely well. So I think a lot of it is just trial and error. Is, is that what you've been finding as well when you've been working with your clients? Yeah, I mean, it's all about, I mean, the first thing I would tell um, people is to make sure that they're using complementary platforms and they're creating their uh, marketing strategy, specifically their social media strategy, right? So how are you cross promoting this uh, content that you're creating in order to grow the community, right? So if you're constantly only on Periscope, that's not going to be very effective for you. And the same goes for any other platform. How are you coupling that technology with another social platform to increase your reach and the social graph, right? So Periscope couples very well with Twitter and for example, Snapchat, right? Because you can actually okay. prompt people and push people to different places. So to answer your question about trial and error, it's about really making sure that when you do set something up, um, I would say to make sure that you're constantly tweaking it to make sure it is optimized, that you're doing it right. And so you're open to that, m those minor changes that are going to make bigger impacts and bigger waves in your uh, end, end goals. Right. And so I'm curious then how often would you say people should be, you know, actively on social media or the different social media channels, like multiple times a day, a few times a week? Um, how do you feel about that? Oh God, that's a pretty loaded question. Um, I think <laughs> that I, I I don't I don't think there's like a clear cut answer, right? I think that if okay. you are if you are committed to doing social media, which I think every um, company and business and organization should be doing, of course, uh, you have to be consistent and you have to be dedicated, right? right? And so it's like saying, you know, how all in are you with your HR department, right? Like. Are you like asking right. for feedback sometimes or maybe like a little bit of the time? It's like the sales department, right? Like, are you selling all the time or just like sometimes? So you really have to think about it as it kind of affects every part of your business. And so to answer your question specifically, it's about setting up a strategy that is consistent, right? That you are consistently putting out content. And that doesn't mean every day. That just means right. at the same time, right? So your audience knows, like Experion does this very well. Every Wednesday at noon, that is when they are on Blab. And every okay. single day at a certain time, they are on Periscope. 
So their audience knows that there's going to be content for them every day on Periscope. There's going to be content for them once a week on Blab in order for them to come in and join the conversation. And then they are actively engaging on Twitter as well as Facebook and the other platforms, right? And so if you're a large organization, you'll be able to go all in on multiple platforms. If you're a smaller organization, you're going to have to go all in and one or, one or two in order for you to see an impact. And that's probably um, the biggest shortcoming for a lot of businesses is that they think that if they sort of kind of, you know, dabble in social media, they, they'll be able to see results and then they can move forward. But the reality is, is that they have to actually go all in consistently for six months for, in order for them to see results. And they have to play the long game, right? Um, right. You, don't, you don't call someone once and then expect a sale. You have to call them multiple times. You have to create a team. You have to create a strategy. You have to be consistent. And social media, like anything else, takes time. It takes even more time because you're building relationships. If you think right. about you know, your life and how many friends you've made, how long did it make you to make those friends, right? How long did it take you to make those relationships? And so that's how you have to approach it's really more of an investment long term. Whereas, okay, I'm going to put in 10 hours this week. Let me go check what the ROI was because you're not going to be seeing it immediately if you have to build your brand equity from scratch. Sure. No, I think that's super important because I think some people just think that you, you tweet randomly and, and then they wonder why they don't have followers or whatnot. And, and it does make sense to kind of plan your social media strategy. And it's good to know that it could take half a year or longer to kind of build up a good following of people. No, that's, that's interesting. Um, another question that's coming through on the chats is kind of, I guess, any tools that you could recommend um, to watch for kind of changes and updates on various social sites that you use personally, maybe? Yeah, so um, my own podcast that I do with uh, Mr. Okay. Carlos Gill called uh, Social 545, What's Trending in Social Media. We talk about all the latest um, updates in social media, and we talk about a lot of the different ways the influencers are basically propelling the social space forward. So an example of that is... Um, in December, uh, DJ Khaled had a huge push on Snapchat and he basically became Snapchat famous overnight and his career has basically jump started again with 2 million impressions per Snapchat. And so we had a oh, whole wow. conversation about sort of you know, what his strategy was, how he's doing product placement and sort of why he's been so successful and how other brands can really learn from him. Another example of this is um, a CEO and an investor, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's gone all in to Snapchat as well. So we talked about his case and sort of the Gary V effect of things. Uh, this week, we launched um, the newest episode about what is Peach. Uh, Peach is a new social network that just came out and a lot of people are discussing. And so if you subscribe to that podcast, um, we talk about what's trending on social media. Um, where, Just so the listener, where again can they find um, those episodes that you've done in the past? Yeah, so if they just go to iTunes... Uh, and they okay. search social five, four, five, uh, they'll be able to find the content. Um, it's also syndicated on YouTube if you want to watch the video versions of it. And they're also available on Blab as replays on my profile if you want to consume them there. Okay. No, that's awesome. Um, okay. Well, I'm kind of curious to know um, what your take is on um, Peach, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have an interview right after this about Peach, so this okay. will be a good right. uh, segue. Um, All right. It's very new, right? So I think today sure. marks, uh, I think, one week and a day that it has been released. It's definitely interesting. Okay. It's uh, a combination of Twitter meets Slack meets Snapchat with a little bit of Facebook. And so it takes a lot of the um, components that you really love or I personally love about the platforms and it takes away all the things you kind of hate. So there's no follower count. There's no following count. There's no profile descriptions. I mean, there's not all that extra stuff that really kind of distracts you from the content. And what I like to say is it's very content centric, right? So the people that have great content get high engagement and the people who don't, don't have high engagement. And it's not about this fancy storefront. And um, if you want to learn more sort of about the details of it, um, the recent podcast, uh, we talked about it this week, but overall it's an interesting platform. I would re uh, recommend if you guys are interested and you know, consider yourself an early adopter to go grab your handle. I wasn't able to grab my full, my first name, uh, which I've been trying to get on a social platform for a while now, but I got my full name, which is consistent. Um, and kind of test it out, play with it. Um, it's really interesting. You can post a lot of gifts in there. Uh, you can post your battery life. There's all these magic words. It's, it's very new. It's very innovative. And if you're into things like that, um, I would definitely recommend you downloading it. Yes, it's called Peach. 
Okay, interesting. So is it just web or mobile as well? Or, or what kind of mediums is it on? Um, so yeah, it's currently only available to mobile iOS users. Okay. Okay. Interesting that they didn't go Android out of the gate or at least both, but it happens. I don't, like, so I don't know if any app goes Android out of the gate. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very rare. I, I don't know. Like, I guess I'm an Android user, but I have iOS devices, but I prefer Android, but whatever. <laughs> Got it. So, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. So I'm kind of curious maybe to cover a little bit more on the Periscope side of things. Um, just kind of other uses for it, because from what I understand, they expire, correct? Yes. So they are not available after 24 hours, unless okay. you, um, actually connect your profile to catch and catch okay. actually, um, basically stores that content for you. And you'll be able to then, uh, promote it even once the replay is gone after 24 hours and catch is um, accessible through your browser and I believe um, on a mobile device I think okay Th that's not made by Twitter though correct mm -hmm. no catch is a third-party application uh, that uses their API in order to help users uh, basically uh, keep their content for longer or be able to store it somewhere um, other than their own cell phone, right? That's accessible because when you, um, right. so for those of you who are not familiar with Periscope, uh, when you Periscope, you have the option in the settings to actually save that content on your camera roll. And now be, be very aware that if you're doing a scope for, you know, your scopes are usually not one or two minutes. They're probably between, you know, 15 minutes to an hour, hour and a half. So, um, you know, it starts taking up space in your phone very quickly. And so although you might want that content later to post micro bits of it, you know, as maybe a Twitter video later on for promotion, it's probably best for you to link up your profile with catch and make sure that that content is captured on that website. So you can also pull it from there. If you decide to take off your phone, and put it on the cloud somewhere. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, just another question, um, from the listeners, um, any tips on how to control or prevent trolls from appearing on Periscope? Um, there's really no way to prevent it, obviously. Um, you know, the internet is a large space with a lot of humans. Um, I think a couple of uh, steps you can take in order to make sure that um, it doesn't kind of get out of hand is one, to make sure that you don't acknowledge them. Right. Because a lot of the times they're there to distract you. They're there to kind of throw you off your game. Um, they're there for a reaction. And so if you don't engage with them, um, the chances of them probably just leaving the room or, you know, just stopping whatever they're doing is very high. Another thing you can do is you can just actually uh, click on their name right from the screen really quickly and then just click block and they'll be kicked out of your room permanently and they won't be able to access any of your other content. Um, and so that would okay. probably be like my two tips. Um, after that, um, it's really about making sure that you block the right people and then just being aware so that they don't do anything. But um, Periscope has, you know, taken a lot of steps to make sure that uh, trolls are not able to kind of penetrate the content. And also there's, I think, a few key words that if you use those in the comments, um, it'll automatically block the, per block the person. Okay, so there's a bunch of ways to do it. That's, that's good to know. Um, it seems seems like that's a sufficient answer and it makes a lot of sense to me and and whatnot so i'm kind of curious is there any other kind of maybe tips or things that you kind of tell people that are scared to kind of jump into this space yeah so jump into the space in terms of live streaming yeah yeah so uh what i would tell them is i was scared too <laughs> okay um, fair. although it might seem like i wasn't scared um I was. Um, before I had three live uh, podcasts that I recorded on Blab, I had never done a video show. I had never, you know, done anything live. And so I was intimidated as well. But um, the thing, the good thing is, is that when you don't know what you're doing and you haven't done it before, there's a chance that you don't have an audience. And so it allows you time right. to practice. And, you know, there's a cliche quote where it says, uh, just start. You know, and that's really what you have to do. You just have to start doing the content. You're going to learn as you go. You know, I'm so proud of Kevin for doing this on Blab because now he's kind of gotten a taste of it. He's seeing sure. how, you know, people are engaging. He's getting kind of a feel for what the room feels like. And so next time he does an interview, he's going to know, you know, how to improve himself. Right. 
sure. And so it's really about starting somewhere to have a starting point and then going from there. And if you're, if you're scared, um, make sure you plan or, you know, have a co-host that can maybe carry the conversation a little bit more than you. And so that when you don't feel, when you get scared or when you're unsure, you know, you have someone to sort of balance out the room. And so you're not kind of there alone. No, I, I think that's, that's really good advice. And, and I think that's partly why I started doing this stuff because I feared kind of public speaking. And, and for me, it was getting over kind of my own fears of this, this stuff. Right. And so I thought start off with kind of a, the rate when the radio show came to me, I was kind of, Oh no, I don't want to do this. I've been trying to do a podcast for five years and it finally took something that I was accountable to somebody weekly to actually get me doing this stuff. And so I think, you know, you just kind of need to find something that will motivate you to do it, right? And if you schedule weekly blabs, then it makes a lot of sense, right? And, you know, if you feel accountable and you, you grow kind of a little bit of a user base, then you kind of, well, now you feel obligated and over time you get better at doing it and, you know, and you get more comfortable the longer you do it. It makes a lot of sense. Um, Randy's asking, is Periscope only for iOS or is there is it for uh, Windows? I know it's for Android. I don't know about Windows. I don't. You know? I don't believe there's a uh, Windows application currently. Yeah, it's sorry, Randy. <laughs> it usually seems to take a little bit longer for for them to move to kind of uh, other platforms other than those major two. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the development of these applications are not simple, especially live streaming technology that can work seamlessly um, across different channels. And so, uh, you know, I think iOS was, you know, a big accomplishment for them. And then, you know, they got Android out, I believe, a few months later. Um, yeah, they did. But the platform has really grown. I remember the first 12 hours I was on Periscope when it launched. Um, and it's, it's grown a lot. I mean, the ecosystem has grown, the people have grown, uh, the people that I've been following, I am not a, you know, you know, serial periscoper as much as I am sort of a blabber and content creator and strategist. Sure. But I would say that even those people have improved since they began. And it's really about starting and kind of getting over your fear. And if you feel like, you know what, Periscope is not um, the platform that I feel like I can put my best foot, foot forward, then use it complimentary and make it the secondary platform and use a platform such as Blab sure. or create YouTube content, you know, figure out really what works best for you and try to figure out, you know, how you can best optimize it to, um, reach the goals that you're looking to reach. No, I, I think that's really good advice. Um, another question for you. What do you think the future of Periscope is? Great question. So uh, recently, this this week, actually, uh, Twitter announced that the Periscope uh, streams are going to be available um, in your Twitter stream, which is actually really great. So it's showing more integration. I mean, Periscope was acquired by uh, Twitter before it launched. And so I think the future of Periscope is really kind of um, in parallel to something like YouTube, right? So people on YouTube have their own channels. People on Periscope have their own channels, right? So there, it's a direct way to reach your audience. And so in terms of the future, I think live streaming as a um, medium is only going to grow. And so the content is only going to get better and you're going to be able to actually use it more mainstream. Once we see Periscope broadcast go on Apple TV and things like that, right. um, then you'll be able to maybe watch the GOP debate, not only on CNN, but you can also watch it on someone's Periscope feed. And so it's going to become a more legitimate media and distribution channel. Whereas right now, um, it's a little bit more vacuum in to sort of the mobile um, space, you know, getting those individual notifications or consuming it on your own mobile device. Whereas, you know, in the future, it's going to become more common that you're watching it on your Apple TV, right? And you're kind of watching it like any other show you would watch. Well, that's awesome. So no, thanks again. All right. Well, uh, we'll be in touch and uh, good luck with your other shows and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. I'm also going to be at the Startup Expo in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, February 16th and 17th recording shows. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com. Until next time, keep building the future.